All right, and we should be live. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another session with Dental Shadowers. Today, we're joined by Dr. Bach. We'll be talking about general dentistry. Doctor, thanks so much for, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to connect with us today. Uh, please feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. All right, I can do that. Um, and um, I am Dr. Zoanna Scheinfeld Bach. You see a long last name there. Bach is my married name. So actually, I think the bottom of my screen says Marty Bach, because I'm in my husband's Zoom account. Um, and I left the Scheinfeld off because when I got married, I, I dropped my middle name and kept my maiden name because that's the name I graduated with. And um, I'll share with you shortly, but um, there's a few other Dr. Scheinfeld, so the family recognition um, is there. I was talking a little earlier with John before we went live, but I want this to be um, a very laid back experience. I will share with you uh, how I got here and why I love what I do, but um, there's nobody who needs to impress me. I'm not interviewing you for dental school. So this is for me or my opinion, an opportunity to ask the things that you don't feel like you can ask another dentist that you may be trying to get a recommendation from or shadowing or impressing that to get um, the inside or the, you know, behind the curtain scene. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I just kind of throw up some pictures here, but I do do things outside of, of dentistry, even though a lot of times that feels like most of my life. Um, I, I love to travel and play sports. In a former life, I played a lot of soccer. Um, as you can see, there's a few photos there of my husband. We're big sports fans. I went to Georgia undergrad, so we're big Georgia football fans and big Braves fans. And our newest addition is, is there in the center who hopefully you won't hear in the background crying. Um, but when you guys reach out to me, it actually um, was a, on a Friday where we were emailing back and forth to pick a date. And I was delayed in responding because I worked that Friday and then um, my water broke that evening and <laughs> my daughter was born the next morning. So I had to apologize on my delay in getting back to you guys to set a date, but I'm glad we found one. Um, no, so Dr. Can... Bach, I think that is just a, a <laughs> next level, a mythical level of, of selflessness right there. We appreciate well, it. We, we all, you can do it. You'll see it's, it takes some juggling, but if dental school teaches you anything, it's um, how to be adaptable, how to multitask um, on a lot of levels, both with patients and, and just with an office in general. Um, and so, like I was saying, my maiden name is Scheinfeld because I'm not the first Dr. Scheinfeld. Um, in the top left, you'll see a picture. That's my mother graduating from Emory Dental School, which doesn't exist anymore. She was part of the last class out of there when she finished her residency. And she was actually pregnant with me. She, she did her undergrad for dental school there. And then she's a prosthodontist, which I can talk a little bit more about. Um, and was finished that in 1988, which was the last class of the dental school. And because she was pregnant during her residency, um, the top right corner is actually a baby picture of me. Um, she was given a shirt that said, I love my dentist, she's my mom. So when I got into dental school, I kind of recreated that memory for, for my parents and made a shirt that you'd say that says, I love my dentist, she's my daughter. This is a short little video believe it or not, but back in 2010, I did not have an iPhone. So the quality is not great, but. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So obviously we're, we're, we're big, big fans of this. This is a, is a, a family deal for me. I grew up in a dental office. I had that, that privilege. And my sister is also, oops, let me go to next slide. My sister is also a dentist. Um, so the three of us practice together. And um, the pictures down here in the left are from both of our graduations. Dental schools have a unique tradition called when you graduate that you get hooded and a lot of doctor degrees have hoods 
I'm not so familiar if, if every other doctorate degree does this tradition, but if you have a family member who is in the same profession, you get to actually hood them. So it was a really special honor that when I graduated, my mom got to hood me versus, versus the dean doing it, who if you don't have a family member, that's who does it. Um, and then when my sister graduated, my sister was in the class behind me, we both got to hood her. So this is definitely a um, family affair. I just posted one little article about that. We, we practice together. We have two locations that we alternate between. My mom has obviously been practicing 30 plus years. And after my sister and I graduated, we opened a second location and started that up from scratch. So that taught me a lot of other new things in comparing joining a existed, existing really well-established practice to how much my sister and I learned from really starting from scratch and it being our baby that we essentially ran. And we still alternate between both. And I've had the benefit of taking things to both offices in the sense of the systems that were in place and worked really well for my mom, putting them in place at a new office, but sometimes doing things new, there were a lot of things we could bring back because you'll find just as you get older, sometimes you get in a routine and you don't know about everything else that's out there or how to do it differently. Um, so my journey to get here educationally wise, like I said, I went to, to Georgia undergrad and I actually was a, a psychology major with a biology minor. And while I was in college, there was a point where I knew I wanted to do something medical. I had not completely locked in dentistry. And so I was kind of wavering between dental school and med school. And so I, in the year that I decided, I worked with my mom a bit more. And I also did my master's at Georgia State and got a master's in biology, which for me was a great transition year. So if you don't get into dental school the first time where you want an opportunity or a different avenue or something to improve your resume to get in, um, grad school was really, a, as far as the demand curriculum wise, I feel like a good hybrid between the, the leap between undergrad and dental school, because in undergrad, you know, everybody might be, if I remember correctly, but you take, you know, maybe 12 to 18 hours a semester in dental school, all of a sudden you're taking 30 or 40 hours a semester. So it's a big jump. Grad school was kind of in the middle of that. So it made that transition easier for me. And then, so I did, and Georgia State offered a great one-year master's program. So I was able to do it in three semesters, which is why I chose that program and why it worked out. Um, then I went to dental school at what I started was called the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. It's the only dental school in Georgia. It had a few name changes a, along the way. Um, that's what my acceptance letter said, Medical College of Georgia. My white coat said Georgia Regents University. My diploma said Georgia Health Sciences University, maybe. I can't, <laughs> it changed about four or five times. There's a lot of politics behind that, but it's, it's still the same place. And then after I graduated, I found during dental school, I really favored or I liked a lot of the surgical side of dentistry, but especially implants, but I did not get a lot of exposure to them in dental school and definitely no hands-on experience. So I did a one-year residency program in Birmingham that was very focused on implants essentially. And that's something to worry about at a later date, but every specialty has a residency program, but there's kind of a sector of residency programs called GPRs or general practice residencies, which are one year programs, which is kind of like a fifth year of dental school. But depending on the program, they kind of focus differently. There are GPRs that are very hospital-based, and you can see a lot of trauma or emergencies. There are ones that are very kid-based. There are ones that are um, just, again, fifth year of dental school, bread and butter dentistry. And then there are some that are more surgery related. And this one I found, I just did a ton of extractions, bone grafts, and implants. And that's what's something that I wanted to do a lot of. It's a really unique 
um, GPR because it's it, it's an extension of UAB and it was founded pretty recently, I think about eight years ago, where one of the dentists, one of the professors from UAB was actually volunteering at a, it's called the Foundry, but a drug and rehab recovery center, where as you can imagine, the people coming out of that amongst their other needs, drugs have a very detrimental effect on the teeth. And so he started seeing them as, as a free clinic and then realized there was such a large volume of patients here who really had more extreme tooth needs that they weren't just the cleanings and the fillings and crowns, but most of them were losing a lot of teeth because of, of their history of, of drug use and could by no means afford in, in private practice, all new teeth. And so this became a, a, a program that he merged the two so that it was mutually beneficial where all of these patients who essentially needed all new teeth couldn't afford them and students and groups of people who really wanted to learn how to place and, and do implants and, and hybrid so that there was this constant patient pool coming in of people who needed teeth and a constant flow of, of students who really wanted more practice doing that before you go out and graduate um, without doing some of the other specialties that have residencies where you will also learn implants. But if you, for me and for a lot of people, if, if you don't wanna limit yourself to um, just period, being a periodontist or just being an oral surgeon, this was kind of a hybrid. So that's kind of my story. Um, advice for pre-dental students, things that I would recommend is the first two are probably the, the biggest one I would say um, is working in a dental lab, which doesn't get promoted enough. But when you go through dental school, it's, it's hands-on. It's not just the didactics of studying and learning and taking tests. You spend half your day doing that and the other half you're hands-on for the first two years and the second two years everything is essentially hands-on and you learn how to do all of the lab work yourself even when you get into practice I don't I don't do a lot of lab work now but you need to learn how to do it so that you know when your lab is doing it correctly or not or how to instruct them or how to check them so dental school teaches you how to do all the lab work and when I say lab work I'm referring to crowns, bridges, partials, dentures. Also, you do a lot of hands-on where you, you train your hands on plastic teeth and deniforms before you cut on real teeth. And I did not, I worked minimally in a lab. And if I could have done anything to give me, myself a better advantage in dental school, I would have worked more in a lab. The, my classmates who worked in dental labs, when it came to the clinical side of things, were had a huge head start and we all got to the same place dental school make sure you all get there but they started miles ahead and it took the rest of us time to catch up and all get on the same pace because they had just had we had three or four classmates who worked in dental labs and they had a tremendous amount of exposure to things that you will not see in a dental office because a dentist doesn't do it generally and they also had had a head start on honing their manual dexterity and their their hand skills on how to do things so that when they were taught something new it came quicker to them than i would say it was the rest of us so that would be the number one thing i would say the number two thing um, would be to not just shadow a dentist but ask to work in an office and most dentists that i know would be happy part-time or not to take somebody on as an assistant because it's shadowing gives you some exposure, but there's nothing you're ever going to do in dentistry that you'll really learn till you do it yourself. And granted, you're not going to be in the dental chair side, but a dentist who wants to teach you will show you a ton. I actually have, let me see if I can find a, this text message. We have a, a um, now in dental school, we had an assistant who worked for us for this past year until she started dental school. She 
graduated from Texas, took a gap year, worked with us, and then is now at Colorado starting. And she sent my sister, my mom and I a text three weeks into school. So this was last week saying, Hey guys, I know it's been a while since I've reached out. It's been an absolutely crazy few months. I just started my third week of classes out here and I absolutely love it. My classmates and the faculty are so great. We just bought our loops and turned in our first wax up of number eight and I did really well. I know a big part of that was because of all the training and care I received from y'all. They call this our quote honeymoon phase where things aren't so bad and they'll get worse. But I know I'm prepared because you made sure I would be. I just wanted to say thank you for all of your help along the way. I feel your influences every day. And this is not me tooting my own horn, but she was someone who is going to be an amazing dentist, but I know is better set because she wanted to learn. And so we were happy to teach her. And even though it was very bittersweet because she's the best dental, one of the best dental assistants I've ever had and to lose her is hard. I know she's going to do really well because we were able to let her see both sides. Um, And I don't know how many people are in the Atlanta area or not. I obviously have two offices there and and my contact info will be at the end. If anybody wants to either shadow or, you know, find a way to, to get a little bit more experience, I'd be happy to share that. I've had other, lots of dental students shadow me. We have a new um, assistant who just started who same thing is applying to dental school and her father's a dentist in Miami excuse me, but she lives here and is in school and wants to work part-time so that, you know, she has that. Um, If you can't find it in your schedule to work at a lab or dental office, there are tons of health departments everywhere in every state that have dental clinics and people that kind of don't know about them, but they love volunteers and they're more flexible schedule wise that if you you know, reach out to one and then you can usually on a last minute say, I've got a Friday off or a Saturday or a diff, you know, here or there one or two days a month that you go volunteer. There are dentists that volunteer and oversee the treatment, but the same environment where generally we're in a field, we like to teach people who are interested in dentistry. So even if you get to assist on some extractions or a root canal or fillings, that's a different way to go about it, that would be my suggestion. Um, Also in the shadowing field area, I would say shadow different specialties. And when you're applying or interviewing, I would not limit or lock yourself into one specialty. Even, Even if it may be the one that you do for forever, both from the side of make sure, make sure you've been exposed to all of them. And also just from a interviewer side, they don't want to hear that you're, you, you are saying, I want to be an orthodontist. I've wanted to be an orthodontist my whole life. From the perspective of, of the dentist generally interviewing, um, it, it's not favorable. I don't know how else to explain it other than it's, it kind of sounds the same that if you ask every freshman who applies to college, uh, how many of them are pre-med and then how, end up, how many of them stay that way, that changes a lot. And so I, I would never, even if you have some great story about how your childhood orthodontist or your childhood pediodontist or story, you can include those in, in making it personal, I would say, but I would not lock yourself into it. You get to make that, you got plenty of time to make that decision once you get into dental school. And I, I found classmates who changed their mind, who thought that's what I wanted to do going into it. And it changed. I honestly wasn't exposed to a ton of surgery until I got to dental school. And so most of what I knew dentally was on the restorative side. I'd gone with my mom to some of the specialists she referred to at the time and seen it, but it wasn't until I got in there more hands-on that I was like, wow, I really love this. And for my benefit, it allowed me to bring something different back to the practice because my mom doesn't do a lot of surgery. So that's a different element. Um, The last thing was kind of, um, you know, just in regards to the DAT, don't be afraid to take it more than once. That's not usually a frowned upon thing. Uh, if you can do better, even in just one area, th- they'll see that as an improvement. So you're not locked in. Um, what's a general dentist? I did listen or I logged on to, your, to the YouTube page and listened to some of the other ones. So I'm going to try not to be redundant if people are here more than once. And I don't want to bore anybody. 
but a general dentist is kind of the catch-all. It's whatever whatever you want it to be. Um, traditionally, I think it's known for being the the fill and drill, the essentially fillings and crowns and and cleanings. But it's a lot more. I really love it because I get to do a dabble in a little bit of each of the specialties and I get to pick and choose what I want to do and not. And if I don't like it, I have somebody I I love and respect and appreciate my specialist. That's who I send it to. Um, and you will hear sometimes, which is not a specialty, but cosmetic dentistry is a, a catchy word that floats out there that there's no such thing as, as a cosmetic dentist. In essence, every dentist should be a cosmetic dentist. Your goal should be that it's aesthetically pleasing. There's, I am never doing anything that I want it to be an ugly tooth. I, I want everything to look pretty, but you'll hear from the layman side when people are looking for a dentist, I get asked all the time, are you a cosmetic dentist? And I'll just say yes, because that's my goal <laughs> is, and there's, they, they will teach you in dental school it's how to make it functional and aesthetic. That's the goal to make it look natural and pretty. Um, some of these other specialties that people are not familiar with, but I do kind of dabble in. So orthodontists do braces and now what we call clear aligner trays, which are trending in all kinds of forms. I don't do traditional brackets or braces. I do um, limited ortho with the clear aligner trays. The technology is really improved to the point, and I'll talk about that later, but with intraoral cameras where you can essentially scan a mouth and create a 3D image of that person's mouth and take those trays and plan out, here's where we are point A and here's where we wanna get to ideal and how to have micromillimeter movement of those teeth and get there. And computers have been wonderful for that. So. I do several of those cases, things that require orthognathics or major comprehensive ortho, I don't dabble in, that's what I send out to an orthodontist. Um, pedodontists are specialists who obviously see kids. As a general dentist, I see kids, um, I see well-behaved kids. <laughs> so that's another thing. I have a lot of kids that I love and I'm happy to see them, but there will be some that I come across that whether it's a parental issue or behavioral or some other factor where there's somebody better suited for that. And I love my pediodontist for it. Um, oral surgeons, again, this is this list that I wrote here is very limited in what they do. And some do major surgery. Some are traditional oral surgeons where they just do, they pull wisdom teeth and they put implants in. And some can do everything from really they're an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. So they can do trauma, they can be on call at hospitals. They're trained really as a dentist and then as a MD, as a doctor in most residency programs where they're dealing with car accidents and, and jaw fractures and, and full, full facial reconstruction. That's beyond my arena and not what I wanna dabble in, but I do do extractions and bone grafts and implants. Um, a periodontist is, is what they call kind of a gum specialist. They deal with a lot of the fancy term periodontal disease, but essentially bone loss. We talk about in commercials or you hear them for toothpaste or toothbrush about gum disease. And you'll learn in dental school, it's not really gum disease. It's usually bone disease. It's usually that the bacteria is under the gums and eating away at the bone and there's bone loss. But for general terms, we call it gum disease. They do do also gum surgeries. Um, they'll place implants if their residency program teaches that. An endodontist does root canals. And I love my endodontist because I do not like root canals. And that. For somebody else who really wants to do that, I'll, I'll, I'll do some simple straightforward ones here or there, but for the most part, um, the specialist is there for a reason because they do that in and out every day. And, and I love that they love them. Um, and the last one is a prosthodontist, which is probably the least mentioned of the specialties. It has, and it's the fewest out there. My, I 
don't know the numbers anymore, but my mother being a female prosthodontist, and when she went through 30 years ago, it was extremely rare. She only had, I think, 14 females in her class out of 100 and something at Emory. Um, but the prosthodontist, my mother will say she's a souped up general dentist. She just had a lot of training or, or she's the true cosmetic dentist, if anybody was to be called one, where they deal with how to put the bite and the mouth back together when it's doing all kinds of crazy things and how to make things as aesthetically pleasing as possible. I'm very biased, but I will tell you a couple months into dental school and doing a lot of hands-on things. I remember calling my mother because she's a very humble woman and saying you you're you're way smarter than you let on because I had no idea how hard all of this was and you make it look so easy and she loves what she does I've had the fortune of I've learned a lot more pro stuff than I did in dental school from working with her which is really nice but they're harder to come by there are fewer of them mostly because it's a tough residency and in the real world unfortunately the people who need prosthodontists, who need somebody because their mouth is so complex, a lot of times can't afford it. So those two things go together. So she will say she's a souped up general dentist because she also does fillings, straightforward, crown, bridge. She's grown a general practice. And then she gets to pick and choose those really complex cases because they take most of them 12 to 24 months and they're you know, tens of thousands of dollars. They're 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 hard for both the patient and her, and take a lot of time. But that's kind of that. Um, let me make sure this isn't gonna die. Did you lose me? Hold on. I think my AirPod is dying. Give me one second. Yeah, no worries. Take your time, Dr. Bach. Unmute. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, sorry. Airpo one no. of my AirPods is dying. Um, no worries. Okay. Um, what kind of procedures do I do? I kind of talked about some of that. Is, is hygiene, and that's typically cleaning its exams, fillings, crowns and bridges, dentures and partials. Um, I do a little bit of both. Like I said, when we started a, a new office, I start, my sister and I started doing the hygiene to get to know the new patients and get to know their mouths versus my mother's office who had full-time hygienists. I only did the exams. I found that you can pick and choose what balance you want and I can do it when I want to and when I don't. Um, so I do all the general family dentistry stuff. Like I said, because of my residency, I also do a lot of extraction, bone glass, uh, bone grafts, I place implants, I do some limited ortho and Botox is kind of a newer side area of dentistry that dental school did not talk about it at all, but does, um, there are programs that offer a certification in it. Botox is botulism toxin for those who aren't aware. And just like we get a tetanus shot or we're worried about um, the botulism toxin, it has been refined and used the same way in medicine. The way it works on wrinkles is it's essentially a, a paralytic that you potentially put that relaxes the muscles, prevents them from contracting. In dentistry, we use it both for aesthetics and a lot for the masseter muscles for people who have clenching and grinding issues and typically have headaches, pain, TMD, temporal mandibular disease, or what they call TMJ issues. You will find, you will learn the anatomy of the face so, so well. And a dentist actually gives more injections in the face than any other physician or profession. So there's been a shift to certifying and allowing dentists to do Botox. It's pretty straightforward. It's honestly 
a much easier thing to add. So it's something if you're interested in, it's there. Um, a typical day is hard for me to put in because in the six years I've been practicing, there's not been one single day that what my schedule said in the morning is the same thing I did by the end of the day. It is always different. So when I talked about dental school teaches you to adapt, it's, that's the biggest thing and, and multitask and juggle because people will cancel, emergencies will call, people walk in, what you thought was a filling turns into a crown or what you thought was a crown turns into an extraction. Um, what somebody describes in the phone that's a little chip is they broke half their tooth when, you know, it, it just always changes. So my Typical day is a lot of juggling, I would say. At my newer office, I have five operatories I'm running at the same time. Two are hygiene and three are dental. And I try to st stagger out my day as best as I can. Um, when I say I do the hygiene, I have assistants who will seat the patient, do the x-rays. I will come in and do the cleaning and then they can floss and polish, do, schedule the next appointment. But I can do that and while they're flushing, polishing, I can go to another room and get somebody numb. I can come back and do another cleaning and then bounce back and do the filling. Um, I do all kinds of stuff from tons of crowns on one patient to a day to a bunch of individual ones to uh, emergencies who are coming in. It, it just changes constantly. There is a front office side of it that you also are not taught in dental school and learn to juggle. I listened to one of the previous dentists talking and uh, he said something that I know almost every dentist says that dental school is hard, but once you get through it, you learn dentistry and that becomes the easiest part of your day. The, the business side of it is unfortunately the, the much larger stressor from from patients to managing to employees to the last 18 months, COVID is a whole, you know, curveball none of us saw coming that we all as dentists had to shift and figure out how do we still keep taking care of people and do it safely. And that was, and still is something, a challenge that we have found with different PPE and different protocol and things that you've got to, you've got to adapt and learn on the fly and kind of go with it. Um, what kind of complaints do I get? Um, I generally put things into two categories of most of the complaints or things that people call in for. Um, we joke in dentistry, but it's either pain or vein, either something's hurting or it's a front tooth and it matters what they look like. Those are the most common quote, complaints patients present with. Toothaches, um, there can be a lot of things and I didn't list them all out. Most of them fall into, it's an infection or an abscess tooth that either it's a new patient, you've never seen them, or it's one you've told about this cavity for a while. And I often say, don't kill the messenger or just cause I found it, I didn't put it there. <laughs> but those cavities will not go away. Even if you don't feel them, usually you don't feel them. That's a good thing. If you're feeling them, that means something else is going on or it's, it's a bigger problem, but there are infections or an abscess and, or it's a fractured broken tooth. There's a lot of other things I could put on, but that gets into small details. Um, the vein side of thing, like I said, is, is typically people have chipped or broken a front teeth and, I try to never send anybody home without front teeth. Sometimes it can be whitening and that kind of thing. Um, diagnostic tests and instruments used. Um, again, this is a very limited list, but most of my diagnosing or most dentists, I break it up into two areas where there's kind of a radiographic exam and a clinical exam. So x-rays are our, our lifeline and our Bible. They tell us so much about the teeth from decay, cavities, infection, um, bone loss, calculus, all kinds of different syndromes or pathologies. Give me one second. I apologize. I do have a crying baby that I'm going to give my 
has been a bottle. Let me pause. No worries. Only six weeks. Hold on. Two seconds. Take your time. Am I back? You're back. Okay, sorry, I apologize. No, no worries. Totally uh, understand. <laughs> it's a lot of adapting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyways, back to what I was saying, x-rays, which they'll teach you a lot of things. And when I've had students shadow me or work with me, I've loved to show them in real time how I, see things and because there's a period of time before dental school where a x-ray just looks like an ink blot test and you have no idea what you're seeing. It's just black and white to really seeing all these different details and it's amazing. There's so many of my patients who I can just see their x-ray and know who which patient it is that I don't have to see their name or face but once you go through them constantly every day, and you could pick, you could go through my patient pool and pull up random x-rays and I could tell you exactly which patient that was because you learned them so well. Um, the other side is kind of the clinical exam. I put some instruments on here, but you know, the first one really is your eyes. You'll see a lot and learn what's normal and not. Um, a mirror helps you see around those things and Explorer is, is an instrument that lets you feel around there. Um, these are some examples of what these instruments do. Um, a perioprobe is, goes along with a periodontist or periodontal disease, but it lets you feel bone loss or spaces, things that are missing um, or abscesses. A tooth sleuth is something patients use to bite down on that helps you tell if they're having pain when chewing or biting. Articulating paper is, something that marks temporarily when, when people bite down and slide around. So it shows you their bite also can tell you things. Um, some of the other diagnostic tools we use is percussion, palpation, and temperature. So if percussion is if I'm tapping on a tooth or several teeth, if I'm trying to isolate which one's hurting and it hurts pretty gentle tapping, if it causes a big reaction, you know, something's going on. Palpation is when I'm rubbing on those teeth and temperature sensitivity. So we have instruments where we can blow really cold air and generally every tooth is vital or if they're vital teeth, they'll have a reaction. But if one is hurting more than the other, it'll be more extreme. You'll send, you'll, I try to warn them, I'm not trying to send you out of this chair, but we're trying to figure out which one is hurting. Um, okay, new technology and dentistry. I mentioned some of these already and this is some of the stuff I use in my office. So that's why I talked about them, but a CBCT or a cone beam CT, which is essentially a 3D x-ray. I use this on all my implant patients. I don't really believe in placing implants without it. There's a lot that you can get from 2D images, which are PAs and Panorexes, but you really need a 3D image for the anatomy. So every patient that I place an implant on, I take a cone beam CT and I mark up their anatomy. I mark where their nerves are, where their sinuses are. It lets me measure pretty precisely down to micromillimeters, um, the width and height of, of bone. And I can also virtually place my implants so that I can guesstimate what size implant is gonna fit in, the, in that space and whether they are a good candidate for implants. Implants, unlike natural teeth, need their vascular system from the bone. Natural teeth can get their blood supply through the tooth and the little ligaments that hold it in the bone have a blood supply running 
between it. So they don't need the same thickness, but an implant needs a certain amount of bone around it with height to be successful because it essentially fuses to the bone, but we need healthy bone. So this lets me decide that if they have an F bone and on the bottom, generally the biggest factor is you have two big nerves running through the bottom jaw that come out about here. We don't wanna be near those nerves. I don't wanna take away any of your feeling. On the top, the general bigger factor is your maxillary sinuses are typically very close to where the tips of the roots of teeth used to be. Um, and other things we use is like I was talking about a intraoral scanner or camera that creates digital models. I use these in my office. I do some traditional dentistry, which is impressions, which is full mouths full of goop. And sometimes those are needed, but the world is shifting to a lot more of this, which patients both like, and the precision is improving a lot where I will take scans of their teeth and then 3D printing in mills where from those digital scans, a computer can now print that tooth and, and mill the crown out of a block versus traditional dentistry. You would have to wax it up and cast it the same way you would make jewelry. Um, important terms in dentistry. I didn't know exactly what you were looking at for, but I put a list of kind of the common terms of how we say them in dentistry and what patients tend to say are the layman terms. Dentistry honestly is its own language and you'll learn that once you're there. It's, it's a whole, and I could go on and on, on every side of the tooth, every surface of the tooth has a term, every ana anatomy or anatomical direction has something. But the common ones I hear all the time that I teach patients or I use, but dentists say decay, patients will say cavity, a dentist will typically say crowns, you'll hear caps a lot. Um, instead of an implant, patients will say a post. A cleaning is a prophylaxis. Um, occlusion is the term used instead of discussing their bite. I will say third molar and have to remind the patient that's their wisdom teeth. Um, calculus versus buildup. And then the last two are kind of categories of, of restorative dentistry, which we generally break into what's called fixed or removable. Fixed means I can't take it out of your mouth removable I can. So fix includes crowns, bridges, implants, and removable is dentures or partials. And patients sometimes call those plates. Um, I put a couple different cases in here of ones I've done in the past. Um, this are, these are just two different denture patients that you, know, you can see a big difference. Um, I probably should have put a warning up that they're a little bloody, but this patient on the left is a gentleman who obviously did not have a lot of teeth left and came in and asked what his options are. Uh, dentures are becoming less common as implants are becoming more common. Implants are becoming more the standard of care that we're replacing teeth as we lose them. But there are a lot of cases that implants, I mean, dentures still work great for. The upper and lower jaw are really different when it comes to dentures. And this is because the upper jaw, you don't have any muscles up there. And so essentially a denture can fit like a suction cup. And if you take out all the teeth, you can get a nice seal and fit and not have to worry about the other teeth. So when there's only a few left, I lean towards a denture with a lot of patients because it's more cost effective. And I have kind of a clean slate to give them both functionally and aesthetically a better look. The bottom is a different beast. I am not excited to do dentures on the bottom and I usually won't do them unless I can put at least two implants in there to hold the denture in. And that's because your bottom jaw, you have your tongue and your floor of your mouth. So every time you eat, swallow, chew, talk, you can have the most expensive denture in the world and the most perfect fitting denture, no matter what, it's still gonna move. So, I either lean towards, if they have healthy teeth, some down there to, to maintain, more to a partial, so there's something to hook on or anchor that denture, that partial to, or if they don't have any teeth that can be saved, putting implants in, and there are things called over dentures that you can either 
create where they work like a snap, like buttons and snap on top. Um, but these are patients I did some dentures on. Here's kind of a different case, which was a more unique, a trauma case, a patient of mine who actually had special needs. She fell and hit and knocked her front teeth loose, not out, but loose. Um, thankfully she's been successful. One of the things I really wished was when she, she went to an emergency room and it depends on where you go. And, and there may not have been an oral surgeon on call to have seen her. And that would have been her limitation, but the sooner loose teeth are put back in the socket, the better chance they have of survival. She came and saw me the next day. Um, these are the x-rays where I tried to circle. Um, they kind of go left from right that the initial space that was there, how far the tooth had dropped down. And what I did on her, which is not a common dental procedure, but I basically popped them back into the socket. Um, in both cases, I've seen her two years since and they're still intact. She was one I had really to prepare her mother. We're gonna try this, but I don't know how long it's gonna last. It may or may not because the body will figure out sometimes that the tooth has died and rejected, that the nerve won't take, but it's an, un I don't get a lot of trauma, but usually two or three cases a year we'll have, we'll have things like that. And then she did get a crown on that tooth that's broken off so that we put her all back together. Um, here's another kind of my bread and butter, a straightforward or a fun case for me. This patient came in, said, I bit down and I feel like I cracked or chipped my tooth. She definitely did. She had a big fracture through there, which you can see in the x-ray and in the intraoral picture. And she had fractured it down to the nerve where how it split would not be an ideal tooth to try to restore with a crown. Um, some of the image doesn't show all of it, but how that tooth had split in half essentially didn't give it a great prognosis to put a crown on top to have any retention to keep it. And it's a lot of money to do that. I practice really conservative dentistry. I try to, even though I'm running a business and you're trying to make money, I don't want to make up the dentistry and I want to do what's best for the patient and to spend the money on the root canal and post and build up and crown on a tooth that doesn't have a great prognosis where in a year or two, it may still snap off and we have to take the whole thing out anyways. I gave her both these options. I always do to let them know, here are all your choices and you get to pick. It's, it's always the patient's patient's choice. She elected to go ahead and have the tooth taken out that day. And I immediately placed this implant in that socket. And then in rare occasions, I will put um, a temporary abutment so that she had a front tooth there to go home with that day. That was not her final restoration, but it was a lateral tooth, which is one of the smaller teeth in the mouth that doesn't take a lot of force on it. So I could basically put a temporary tooth there and adjust her bite so that she never bit into it. Um, the thing with implants is they need healing time. My best analogy is it's kind of like putting a stake in wet cement. You need that cement to harden before you rock on that stake. And so the bone needs to fuse to the implant. In other cases, a lot of times patients will get flippers or partials to cover that, or if it's a back tooth that nobody can see in their smile line, they'll have nothing but a space there before it, the bone fuses the implant before I come back and put a tooth on it. Um, this is my last case that I was gonna show, which is kind of a full mouth case that I'm still working on. I started him almost three years ago and it's, it's a large work in progress. As you can see, he came to me and I have done almost everything on him dental wise slowly as he's had the funds and the time to do it because pretty much every tooth in his mouth had a, had a cavity or was missing. Um, and so these are also his x-rays and this is not actually a current bottom one. It was from about a year ago, but shows some progress. So I ended up doing, extracting all the teeth I couldn't save and putting grafts in with plans to put implants in where you can see some of those. Um, I put, I got rid of all the decay that I could save those teeth and put fillings in some, which were later converted to crowns and veneers. And he is also actually going through limited ortho on the bottom to straighten some crowding there. 
So we and have put some implant bridges on top and we have the same plan from the bottom, but he's been a fun one and a really good patient that I've worked with both time-wise and financially to get his mouth put back together because he let it go for a while and then decided he wanted to make that a priority. Um, advice to future dentists. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes, but it just hones on us from Calvin Coolidge. It says, nothing in this world takes the place of persistence and essentially determination. You can have all the talent and intelligence or health, wealth, anything. I really think what matters most is, is your persistence and determination and your desire um, to do this. Dentistry, you, you have to be consistently persistent. And the other word I would use that I've talked about kind of throughout this is definitely adaptable, is most people who have an interest in, in dentistry are typically type A. Um, people. And that's a good thing. It makes you hardworking, organized. And I've always considered myself or known I'm a type A person. Dental school definitely taught me how to have a type B side, to be more relaxed or more adaptable and, and not stress the fact that the ball is always moving, the game is always changing and take that challenge on versus if you're someone who needs the rudimentary structure and it needs to be exactly the same every day, this is not, not the field or career for you because it's never gonna be that, it's not predictable. And, and that, that needs to be something that helps you thrive, not something that is a deterrent or a challenge for you. Um, and that's it. Amazing, yeah. And uh, what a, I think that was a, a wonderful closing remark. Um, thank you, doctor, for, for sharing with us, um, you know, a wealth of insight that was an incredibly comprehensive presentation. Um, and we really appreciate your, your you know, your, your honesty about the, uh, the profession, um, and your eagerness to, to help students sort of navigate their, their pre-dental paths. Um, I guess I can start off with a question on my end, and then I'll go ahead and hand it off to Kathleen. Um, you know, you, you mentioned earlier in the presentation um, that a lot of students going into dental school have an idea or um, are sort of more motivated to pursue a specialty um, sort of preemptively. Um, and with your background, um, it was sort of unique in that you were exposed to, I guess, many of the disciplines in, in dentistry with your mom being a prosthodontist. What was sort of the motivation behind you pursuing general dentistry? I think... Part of it was dentistry in general met my two needs, which I didn't mention. Dentistry has a large art side to it. And I found, and it's very hands-on. And I've always been someone who has had both an art and science, you know, favoring in my schoolwork or what I did. So, and I, I draw, I paint, and it really is an artistic side, which that's what led me more to dentistry in general that I found, I like the sciences and I like people and patients. What I really like about dentistry, which is different than some of the other medical fields is you see patients on a regular basis. You really get to know them in a lot of other arenas. And this is not knocking them. This is just a personal preference. It's a, a one procedure and done that, that for surgeons or for a lot of things that other than maybe your primary care physician, but you, you don't see people so routinely. So you see the healthcare provider, they treat your issue or problem, and then you, you hope that you don't have to go back to them. Dentistry is a different arena because of the routine hygiene exams. You really, really get to know people on such a personal level. I'm a people person. They are an extension of my family. And even sometimes where they surprise me, like having, having every life milestone I've had and having a baby, how many patients of mine have dropped off gifts and sent cards and said things that when I think about my other physicians who I like, I don't really know that much about their personal lives, but you, you have a, a greater intimacy with them. And general dentistry allows that a lot more than some of the specialties. The specialties typically tend to be 
a one and done thing that if you have an infection or an abscess or hurts and I send you to the endodontist, you hope that you don't see the endodontist again. He, as wonderful as he is, you don't want to need that um, versus my patients generally continue to see me without having always needing a procedure and we get to know each other. So I, I liked that routine aspect of general dentistry. I also liked the, just the variety for my personality. I like that every day is different and that I can do a lot of different things. And I think I would get bored of if I was only doing extractions every day, or I was only placing implants, or I was only doing crowns or only doing fillings. If I just had to pick, there's not one I could pick that I would say, yeah, I wanna just do that every single day. It, it, for my personality, it, the routine would get boring. I get excited and I like the challenge and the variety and the diversity, kind of like that last case where we're doing a little bit of a lot of different things. And I get to pick and choose. And then if I don't want to do them, there's somebody else better suited to, and that's where I send them. Right. And something that stood out to me was um, the slide that said general dentistry is, is whatever you want it to be. So, and that's how I feel. I really do. And, and, and you may be, you may have the personality where you just want to do fillings and crowns. And that's, that's, what's great about it is that you, you can make it what you enjoy doing and what you feel is your best skill set and what you enjoy. I also have the benefit and privilege of practicing with my mother and sister where we, we don't always see each other every single day and we're not in, in each other's operatories for every patient, but we also share so much of the dentistry with us that I have second and third opinions constantly all the time. And, and it goes both ways where my mother will grab me and say, Hey, can you come look at this x-ray? Or will you take a look in this patient's mouth? The patient benefits from more than one eye, or we can talk out still. She's doing it 30 something years later. And I'm regularly still learning when challenges come up, which they will, because everything is not textbook. You'll learn the, the basics and the fundamentals in dental school to get you going. But once you get started, you'll find they don't all fit in the box and you've got to think outside the box. So having exposure to different things makes general dentistry more fun for me, honestly. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it off to, to Kathleen. I think we have a few questions. Yes. So our first question is, can you remark on your patient's reaction after treatment in these cases and how those reactions made you feel? Um, those are all cases where honestly, and I, my goal is always to have a, a happy customer, a, a pleased patient. Um, most of the, the, the cases I showed were pretty life-changing for them. It's amazing how much like a smile drastically can improve somebody's, honestly, their whole life. It, it's so, it's just, it's the first thing people see, whether they notice it or not. And a, a smile lightens up the room. I, it warms my heart when I can change somebody's smile and how many times I, I have brought a patient to tears unexpectedly because of making a drastic difference. It's, it's so rewarding. And some are, are strictly cosmetic, some are functional, but some are giving people their teeth back so that they can chew and eat when they haven't done that in, in years or decades it's, it's humbling. It's, it's incredibly satisfying. It's a really rewarding profession because of that is for the most part, even though most people will say they don't like the dentist and they don't want to go. And I, and they'll tell me that every single day I have. And for me, that's a challenge is how, how do I make you like the dentist? How do I make you like this experience? Because almost every new patient I, I see, especially ones with really challenging mouths, the reason their mouth got there is because they were avoiding the dentist. They didn't want to go, Be whether it was a fear or someone didn't educate them on it or whatever it was. I pride myself in overcoming that and, and letting them know the hardest part was them just showing up. Once you're here, we can find a way to improve it. Dentistry is really neat in, in that aspect as well is their 
generally it might be one wrong way to do it, but there's 99 right ways that there's so many options and it's just about finding which one works for each patient. And, and what I do on one patient may not be what I do on the next one, but as long as we communicate and I give them those options, it's, it's been, you know, rewarding mutually for both of us. That's so nice. I, I love to hear that. I'm sure that'll like help our future dentists really feel like empowered to pursue right. this. Especially, especially in the, in the, in the hard days, it, it really does. A, a, a great patient makes, makes up for everything. That's an, that's a challenge that doesn't go well. Exactly. So you mentioned how the field of dentistry is continually changing. How do you keep yourself updated, updated on the newest information and technology? Um, so each state is a little different, but gen- dentistry in general, you have to maintain your license with continuing education. Um, that's just a mandatory factor for it. But most dentists, myself included, find even if it wasn't mandated, it's I'm always a forever student. I love learning and finding new ways. And so I do it through a lot of different avenues, mostly through either study clubs or conferences um, where you're constantly being exposed. I take a lot of lectures from other dentists. I meet with other dentists where we talk about cases and share stuff. And as new things come onto the market, you have to be open-minded to it, but we're, we, we go all the time and I, I constantly am trying new technologies or new products. Some are fails and some are wins, but I can only improve what I'm doing by giving something a shot. And so I, I, I think what I'm doing now is going to be very different in 20 years, that there will be more improvements. Some I can foresee coming and some I have no idea what they're gonna be. But if, if you limit yourself, you're, you're only hurting yourself and the patient. Exactly, yes. Um, what was the most challenging aspect of dental school? Um, dental school, how I would describe it, is it's not necessarily the level of difficulty, but really the volume. It's just a lot at once. As there's an expression that they'll say, it's like trying to drink from a water um, water hose. I mean, a fire hydrant, because it's just it's a lot. And so that, that to me is the biggest challenge in finding the balance in time, especially the first year or two from the didactic side that I knew I could do it all, but sometimes it does feel overwhelming where you're like, I can learn this if I have the time, but I don't seem to have the time to read everything. Um, And you have to find everybody's study skills or how they learn is different. That's probably the biggest thing if you can figure that out before dental school. And what I mean by that is, are you, are you an auditory learner? Are you a visual learner? Are you a didactic learner? I had the fortune to really know what my skill set was. So I am not an auditory learner. I do not do well retaining information, honestly, looking at a PowerPoint and someone just reading and saying it to me. I'm very visual and I'm very didactic. I need to see it and I, I have to write it out. So I can tell you straightforward, I spent plenty of dental school lectures studying for other classes, not even listening to what was on, what the teacher was going over because that d- is just not how I retained information. I would sit with my laptop open in the class, but I would be reading and writing notes on something else. Thankfully, technology exists now where dental school lectures are all recorded. So if once I got to that topic, if I needed to clarify clarification, I didn't understand something, I could go back and look and and listen to to the lecture. Um, And I'm very hands on. So I I favored the clinical side of of the labs and that I learned well doing things with my own hands. But I have to try it. Somebody can tell me it all day long. I don't retain it unless... I, I see it and I write it down, but I had friends and we would study together. One of my best friends still to this day, she's an auditory learner and she has to hear it and she has to hear it on, on repeat for her retention. So 
uh, dental school, it's just a large volume and sometimes an overwhelming. It's just a waterboarding of information. So figuring out how you learn it best, whether it's flashcards or reading. My, my roommate for all four years of dental school, total auditory and didn't need to write anything down. She would just read it and almost in a photographic memory kind of way. And she'd have this piece of notebook paper where she, I would look at it and it would have scribbles on it. I had no idea, but she would read and kind of just make, jot herself little notes in no organization factor at all. But that's what worked for her. So learning, learning your study habits, your method to how you learn and retain information is, is key to me in the challenge of dental school. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, you brought up that patients are often fearful of the dentist. What are some methods you learned and or used to help a patient feel comfortable with you as a dentist? Um, I don't know if it's, if I can make them so specific, this comes to just bedside manner and personality. I, I talk to patients on a very friend to friend basis where I sit down and I really listen to them and tell them that there isn't anything to worry about and that I'm going to prepare them. I am a very verbal person. As you can tell, I talk a lot. I talk through my procedures too, which is a technique that may or may not work for everybody. My, my mother has a very different personality where she is an amazing, fabulous dentist, but when she's working, she has to be in the zone and she doesn't talk to the patient as she's doing the procedure. I will talk through as I'm going and I will ask those patients, do you want me to tell you what we're doing beforehand or do you want to just sit there and we can put headphones on and play a movie on the ceiling and you don't hear anything or see anything? I ask them what makes them most comfortable. There are a lot of different things that you can do to give that TLC that I am constantly asking, you know, are you okay? Does that hurt? Or I prepare them that, you know, you're going to feel a little pinch here. That's pr probably the biggest element of people who are afraid is the anxiety of what's to come. The actual event isn't so terrible. It's that they mentally fear for it, fear the pain and build themselves up. And I talk them through that and we, we take it step by step. I also, try to only give them sound bites. So I don't overwhelm them. When I present treatment plans or I talk about things, it's exactly like that, where I will say, you know, if a patient comes in pain, I'll say, you know, my phase one is to get you out of pain. So we're gonna talk about this tooth. Once we're out of pain, then I want you to come back and we're gonna take a look at your whole mouth and try to make sure that we don't end up in this situation again. How do we prevent that, that pain you're in? and take it quadrant by quadrant or area by area versus coming to them and saying, you've, you've got 28 teeth that have problems um, and we have something to do. But I think it's a personality and it's reading people and I adapt to personalities all the time. I, I try to learn and say, okay, this is somebody who wants to know everything that's coming. This person does not. And probably the biggest thing is talking to them about not dentistry too. People that enjoy their experience when they leave my office, I think 99% of them never leave saying, well, Dr. Zoe did a great filling. They leave going, I had a great conversation about Georgia football or, or deep sea fishing or their grandchildren or whatever is that level, I find out what they're interested in and I talk to them about that. And that's a huge distractor that they leave going, I had a wonderful time talking to my dentist and I forgot that she poked me with a needle or, or pulled my tooth or drilled on me that, and people love to talk about themselves. So finding their interests and asking them, they'll tell you about what trips they went on, about their grandkids, what their favorite sports teams are, and, and I adapt every conversation to that, to make them feel like a friend, because they are. Yeah, uh, amazing. Um, doctor, we, we understand you're wearing a lot of hats as, as a mother, as, as a doctor. So uh, we just wanna thank you again for, for taking the time out of your schedule to, to connect with us and to share with us um, 
some information about you know your your journey, your background, your clinical philosophy. Um, it's it's been a treat. Um, we'd like to thank you, and uh, we wish you a productive year. Well, I'm happy to do it, and you know my email's on there. Although I realized typo wise, there should should be a T in there. It's right smile center, right as in left. Um, if anybody else watching or y'all see this later, happy to reach out, emailing questions. If you want to come see me in person and in my office, um, I'd, I'd be more than happy to share even more knowledge. Or if you have specific questions when you're going through the application process or interview process, I, I think it's a great field. And I had a lot of wonderful mentors who were happy to teach me as, as I went through and there still are, and I can still approach and ask them. I, and I want it to always be that kind of industry where we're, we're constantly encouraging people to go into it and passing on what's, what's great. I think it's a wonderful field. So I, I wish all of you the very, very best and in, in whatever endeavor and whatever route you go. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again and uh, take care. All right. Have a good one.